Hello everyone, welcome back. I'm Meyer Thacker. I am an equity strategist here at Zach's Professional Services. And uh, today I'm talking about a subject uh, that I've personally been uh, you know, more interested in lately, uh, and that is the subject of share buybacks. And there's been a long-standing debate as to whether share buybacks add shareholder value or if it's just purely financial engineering. And so let's take a look at that and talk about exactly what share buybacks are, what they do, and, uh, and all of that in between. So before we even talk about share buybacks, I just want to take a big step back and look at the flowchart of corporate capital allocation. Um, if you, you know, go back to some of the early interviews of Jeff Bezos, uh, uh, you you know, we'll hear a lot of very, very important conceptual ideas behind running a business. Uh, and the number one job of a manager is to, you know, be an efficient capital allocator. And so what does that mean, right? So we have capital here and capital is the starting point of any business and capital can be supplied from debt it can be supplied by equity and it can be supplied by internal cash flows. So that's the cash flow that the business itself generates that itself can be capital, which is then deployed into the various areas that the management team has expertise in. So that goes into capital expenditures, also known as CapEx. That's all of your things like factories, equipment, uh, machinery, other manufacturing, uh, you know, tools, uh, things like that, you know, buildings, um, those are all capital expenditures. You also invest in R&D so that, you know, it helps improve your product and develop your product. You invest in human capital, right? You need the, the human workforce, the labor to be able to execute and to deliver the product and services that your business produces. Uh, you need to invest in working capital. So that's your inventory primarily. Um, and then, of course, you can use that capital for M&A. Sometimes uh, the best use of capital that, you know, management knows how to, you know, allocate exists outside of your business. And therefore, it makes a lot of sense to target a business, you know, other than your own to, to acquire, to acquire their intangible assets, any patents that they might own, any know-how that they might have, any, uh, you know, other expertise that they might have, or you know, maybe that business can create synergies or enhance your existing product. So M&A is definitely a big use of capital. And then there's also advertising. Uh, so these are the broad, you know, five categories or six categories of items that, you know, management uh, uses uh, in terms of deploying capital. So once you've done all of that, right, once you've invested in your business, right, this is the, you know, sort of the business investment reinvestment area um, once you've done all that then ultimately what ends up happening is that your business produces free cash flow right so that's the cash flow that's left that's the bottom line essentially the, the cash that the business generates after all expenses are met including growth investments like capex including other investments that you've made in your business everything the bottom line is then free cash flow this is why free cash flow is so very much emphasized by great value investors is because when a business shows growing free cash flow, it means that they have increasing optionality. They can then use that free cash flow for three primary purposes. Remember, free cash flow is after all reinvestments back into the business. Okay, so this is the ultimate you know, cash balance that's left over each and every quarter after they've made all of their capital allocation decisions. So that includes, uh, I, and I want to make sure everybody you know, understands this, that, that includes reinvesting back into yourself for growth. So even after you have you know, added a new factory, even after, after you've added uh, or stepped up your R&D to, to improve your product, even after you've made an acquisition, even after you've gone on a big advertising campaign, let's say you've done all these things and you still end up with positive free cash flow, then that becomes you know, the next step of the process, which 
enters into the area of debt repayment, dividends, and share buybacks. So those are the broad three things that you can do that companies can do when they generate positive free cash flow. Now, I also want to, um, I should have added one more layer to this, which is that, you know, sometimes when you generate free cash flow, that doesn't necessarily mean that you do one of these three things immediately. Sometimes positive free cash flow continues without dividend share buybacks or debt repayment um, because the company is shoring up the balance sheet, right? So that also becomes very, very important for management to do is that you know just because you generate positive free cash flow doesn't mean that you should just start kicking that out as dividends or share buybacks um, maybe you want to grow your cash balance to a point where you feel comfortable that you know your business is now de-risked from an external event something unforeseen like a recession uh, other things something else that might be unforeseen like covid where supply chains were disrupted. So you need, you know, a cash cushion in order to weather, you know, some type of a adverse event that that hits your business. So once, you know, that has been achieved and if you still have positive free cash flow after that point, that's when companies can decide to do one of these three things. And that is collectively known as a return of capital uh, back to shareholders, these three ideas here. So share buybacks and dividends are, again, conceptually the same thing. Uh, the only difference is that buybacks are tax advantaged, while dividends are not, unless if it's in a tax, unless if you're, you own the stock in a tax-free account, like an IRA. Um, but conceptually, they're the same thing. You know, the company can pay you a cash dividend, which you can then use to buy more stock of that same company. Uh, which increases your ownership of the company, or the company can do that for you and buy back their own stock. And what that ends up doing is that you avoid paying a tax because you don't have, you know, a cash payment that was received, right, in that case. So, you know, with dividends, you're double taxed because the company already paid a corporate uh, income tax. And then when they pay it out as a dividend to you, you're taxed again. So it's kind of a double taxation. Whereas with share buybacks, you avoid that double taxation. It's just taxed once. Now, ultimately, you still have to pay a tax because once you sell the shares, you know, you do have to pay a capital gains tax. But, the, you know, obviously the benefit there is that you get to defer your tax payment, you know, out into the future as opposed to paying it every single year when you file your tax return. But conceptually, they are the same thing. Um, now, the share buybacks, right, they have a unique effect. So, uh, you know, if you own a company, if you own shares of a company that are buying back shares, what ends up happening is if you're a long-term investor and you continue owning the stock, then over time, you will steadily increase your ownership interest of the company without even short, you know, put, putting up a single dollar of your own capital any, any further, right? Because the float is decreasing consistently, whereas you continue to own the same shares that you've always owned. So as a percentage, um, your ownership of the company gradually increases by the rate at which the company is buying back stock and decreasing the float. At the same time, uh, share buybacks have the effect of increasing the growth rate per share, such as earnings per share and free cash flow per share. Why? Because the denominator is decreasing. So as long as the numerator does not decrease by a greater rate, that as the decrease in the denominator, that number is actually increasing. So you can actually have a case where net income could actually come down, but earnings per share could go up. Because if you bought back stock at a greater rate than net income going down, then on a per share basis, right, that ratio is actually increasing. So, you know, the growth rate on a per share basis um, is higher, you know, versus a company that doesn't do a buyback, you know, all else held equal. It also creates scarcity of share supply, right? Because again, the company is buying back stock, it's removing that from the float. So that creates scarcity in your shares. Um, that also therefore boosts the value per share. And by value, I don't mean uh, the, uh, the price per share, but I mean because there are fewer shares being divided up 
right? The company is being divided up into fewer pieces. Each share therefore owns a, you know, represents a higher intrinsic value, right? Assuming that the business didn't decline in value in terms of its intrinsic value, right? So again, assuming the company stayed the same, you know, at the very least, they stay the same. Uh, each share commands a greater portion of the company, which therefore boosts the value per share. And so if you combine all these effects together, uh, the net result is that, uh, you know, theoretically, again, this is all theory. Let's, we'll talk about whether this is happening in reality or not in just a few minutes here. But in theory, because you're creating scarcity of, of share supply, because you're increasing the growth rate of, uh, on per share items like earnings per share growth, free cash flow per share growth, uh, and bef because each share is, you know, representing a bigger piece of the pie, then in theory, this will boost the share price, the market price per share relative to if they had not done the buyback at all. So under the same set of circumstances, you know, with macro and whatnot, you can have the same company identical. Um, one did a buyback, another did not. Then, you know, uh, the one that bought back shares should see a better price performance versus the the company that did not again this is theory let's do, we'll talk about whether this is actually happening with uh, some actual data and here's just a couple examples uh, this is fair isaac uh, this is actually one of the companies that we've added to our uh, zach's earning certain proxy that's our model portfolio and you can see how this company again fair isaac is the company that puts out the fico score uh, that's the credit, uh, you know, the credit scores that we all have individually, uh, which is the basis on basis upon which so many financial decisions are made by banks, by other lending institutions and whatnot. Uh, but uh, you can see how, you know, Fair Isaac have, you know, has consistently bought back shares. You can see that it actually had a few times where they actually did increase the share ownership. Sometimes that happens because of uh, share based compensation. Uh, so it's not necessarily that they're uh, raising equity necessarily. Um, it could just be because they pay employees in stock options. So that, you know, would increase the, the share count. But over time, you can see how they have very consistently um, essentially gone private, you know, over the past 15 years, really, uh, you know, 13 years, we've, we've went from 50 million shares outstanding to now 25 million shares outstanding. So the share count has been cut in half, uh, which, you know, can provide substantial additional benefits. Again, in theory, we'll talk about whether this actually happens or not. Here's everyone's favorite Apple. Uh, you know, you can see that they, you know, uh, you know, were issuing shares. They didn't do any share buybacks at all or dividends for some time, all the way up until 2013. Again, Apple was just printing free cash flow every single quarter because of these early years of the iPhone where, you know, it was just an incredible bull market for the iPhone. Um, and, uh, you know, Apple basically took the world by storm with the iPhone. And, uh, you know, we all know the story there, but they were not in a buyback phase until 2013. That's when they finally announced that buyback, you know, took place after that famous, you know, meeting. Uh, where Tim Cook, Tim Cook sat down with with uh, Warren Buffett, and uh, you know Buffett basically explained that look, you can't really allow your you know your cash balance to swell indefinitely. You have to at some point put that cash to work. Um, if you're not reinvesting in in more factories, if you're not reinvesting in R and D to make your product better, uh, you know if you're not reinvesting all of that cash, you know back into you know you know acquisitions you know so on and so forth if you're not deploying that free cash flow at some point in the future then uh then you got to start doing something else with it which is a return of capital to shareholders and so that's what they started to do because they said hey you know we we're going full blown full steam ahead with as much capital reinvestment as we possibly can but at some point you know you're just so profitable that you can't actually deploy all that capital back into factories, right? So at some point you got to say, okay, our balance sheet is super strong. 
you know, we can weather a recession for the next three years if that happened. So now at this point, it doesn't make sense to be so risk averse that we just keep hoarding cash. So it's time to now start paying shareholders. And that's exactly what they started to do. And you can see that the rest was history since 2013. You know, we went from about 26 billion shares outstanding to about 15 uh, 0.6 billion shares outstanding. Again, uh, you know, a, a dramatic decrease in the share count. And so let's take a look at that. So uh, remember I said, you know, one of the points of a share buyback is, is to increase the growth rate of earnings per share, free cash flow per share, any per share item. So here you can see exactly what the net result of all these buybacks were. So you can see that on this chart is a uh, is the growth rate, the cumulative growth rate of net income versus earnings per share. Remember, earnings per share is net income divided by shares outstanding, right? So um, you know here we see net income in this golden line right here. You can see that net income is compounded quite you know dramatically here. It's really tapered off interestingly since 2021. So the company's really had no growth a lot over the last two years. That's just a side note. But look at the difference in the cumulative growth rate of earnings per share, right? You can see a stark difference in that. And remember, net income is earnings per share. It's the same thing. The only difference is that earnings per share is a ratio where the denominator is the share count. So obviously, if the share count is decreasing, then earnings per share will necessarily uh, increase at a faster rate than net income. And that's exactly what we've seen here. So, you know, this is a company that has dramatically better growth on earnings per share than on net income. So the buyback can have this effect of a much higher growth rate, even though your fundamental business is not growing any faster from a share buyback. But the point here is that, you know, with the buyback, you're de decreasing the float and therefore you're creating share, uh, share supply scarcity. There are fewer shares uh, you know, to go around that create scarcity. So the idea is that that will actually create higher price per share, right? And also at the same time, you're divvying up the pie in fewer pieces and therefore each piece is larger. It's kind of like you know, slicing up a pizza. Uh, you, know, it's, you take the same you know, pizza and slice it up into six pieces or you know, eight pieces or 16 pieces. Um, ultimately, the pizza, the pizza stays the same, uh, but each slice is bigger or smaller depending on how many uh, slices that you cut. So share buybacks are simply financial engineering because management can artificially inflate earnings per share growth rates by buying back shares. However, as long as the, lo as long as the intrinsic value of the business does not shrink, Share buybacks, by definition, increases share supply scarcity, which in turn increases the share price. Again, all else held equal. However, um, this isn't even the biggest benefit. I haven't even talked about the biggest benefit. This is the true benefit of a share buyback, in my view, and that is the valuable communication that management is sending to you that the shares are, that they believe that the, that the shares are undervalued. Because a, a lot of times companies or managements will uh, buy back shares on a discretionary basis. So not all companies buy back shares in perpetuity. They will use discretion. Uh, so if that's happening, then that's a very valuable communication signal from management that the shares are currently undervalued. Because remember, nobody has more information about the company than management, right? They see the order book in real time. They see their costs, you know, rising or declining in real time. So if they think that this, the stock is artificially uh, depressed right now with no real change in their fundamentals, then they can is initiate a share buyback, um, you know, on a discretionary basis like that to take advantage of a weak share price despite no change in, in fundamentals. So if that's happening, that could be a very, very valuable piece of communication coming from management. So that's something we, we should you know, pay attention to. So here's the ultimate question. 
you know, show us the, show me the data. Do share buybacks enhance returns for shareholders? So let's jump into Excel world here. So what I did here is, um, you know, within our Zax research system, this is our, uh, you know, flagship uh, research uh, software that's used by portfolio managers and analysts. Uh, it, you know, provides a variety of tools and data um, on, you know, over 6,000, you know, U.S. listed, you know, equities. And we have tools such as, you know, Excel tools uh, to build your spreadsheet models. We have screening tools to find companies that match certain criteria. We have a wide array of research reports, uh, you know, estimate revisions and estimates uh, coming in from, you know, the sell side community of brokers and analysts uh, and other variety of, you know, charting tools. But what we also have are backtesting tools. So within our backtesting tool, there is a piece of software called the Rank Analysis. This allows you to test individual factors. So in this case, I decided to test share buybacks as our factor. And the way I set it up was I'm looking for, I'm basically dividing all companies into two buckets, just all companies out there with, you know, that fall in the top 2000 by market cap. So I took, I started, you know, with the universe of the top 2000 companies by market cap uh, every month going back you know, 250 months. Um, and I divvied up all companies into two buckets. Bucket number one are companies that bought back stock, meaning their share count decreased over a two year period. And bucket number two are companies that did not buy back stock. So either they held it steady or they have increased uh, their share count due to equity dilution or due to share, share, um, share-based compensation for employees. So, and then I structured it such that, remember, I don't, I don't want to, I want to be able to isolate uh, the effect of the buyback. So remember, if we just do the buyback alone, that could give us, you know, some erroneous conclusions because what if, you know, the uh, outsized returns are due to growth, for example? We all know earnings growth is definitely a significant contributor to shareholder returns. So what I did was I crossed it with um, five-year earnings per share growth on an annualized basis. So that way we can compare com like for like companies and therefore say, you know, among high growth companies, did share buybacks have a positive, negative or neutral effect on returns? Okay, so I'll show you what I mean in, in here in just a second. This is our how I set it up in our you know back testing engine, and uh, here are the results. So here you see these two fractiles, right? Fractile number one represents companies that bought back stock. Fractile number two or group number two uh, are companies that did not buy back stock. And then these three bars represent the three groups that I created by earnings per share growth over a five year period. So group number, you know, the first bar represents the lowest, uh, you know, third of companies by earnings growth. And bar number two, which is in orange, represents, you know, the middle tier of earnings growth companies. And bar number three in gray represents the highest tier of earnings growth companies. And so, you know, here we can see very clearly that group number one across all three groups by earnings per share growth outperformed their, their counterparts in group number two, which are the companies that did not buy back stock. So interestingly enough, without even going into the growth rates of earnings, every single company by, you know, their different, by their respective growth rate, you know, categories, outperformed their peers uh, that did not buy back stock. So again, the blue bar represents the lowest earnings growth companies, right? And so the lowest earnings growth companies that bought back stock outperformed the lowest growth companies that did not buy back stock and so on and so forth for each group up until we got to the point where this gray bar represents the highest returns among the entire universe of 2000 companies. And that is the group that A had share buybacks and had the highest earnings per share growth over a five year period. So this is very, very interesting and almost, you know, sort of 
wouldn't say conclusive because there's always problems in uh, you know you know in data analysis. There's always other caveats. There's always the you know the question that correlation does not imply causation. There are other factors that could you know play into this, but we can see here. I tried my best to isolate the effect of share buybacks by removing growth as the factor that could be explaining most of those returns, right? Because we can see here that again, um, fractile uh, number three by earnings growth are identical for these two, right? So we're using the same criteria to, to group uh, the upper third of companies by five year earnings per share growth. And so here you can clearly see that among the high growth companies, right? They're all in that same upper 33 percentile by earnings per share growth over a five year period. And you can still see that the ones that bought back stock outperformed their peers that did not buy back stock within that same earnings per share growth category bucket. So again, uh, this goes to show and it kind of, you know, uh, sort, sort of, you know, proves or at least uh, lends a lot of credibility to the theory, right? The theory is, is that once we create scarcity, once we create, you know, larger pieces that divvies up the pie, uh, once we increase the growth rate on per share basis, and of course, you know, increase your ownership interest of the company, then in theory, uh, that should boost the share price relative to if they had not done the buyback at all. So in theory, it should be working. And you know, here we have you know, at least one piece of evidence that does show that buybacks work. Um, you know, even if we, you know, even if we isolate the growth uh, impact on shareholder returns. So I hope you found this helpful, um, everybody. I'd love to hear back from you. Um, if you have any questions, what do you think? Uh, do share buybacks work? Do they not work? Are, are they worth it? Are they not worth it? Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, you know, leave a comment on this video and uh, we will uh, read and reply to all of them. Uh, and if you have any questions, you can you know, feel free to email us uh, at uh, zrs at zax.com. I should say, if you are a ZRS client, please send us an email at zrs at zax.com. If you are a Zax Advisor Tools client, please send us an email at zat at zax.com. And if you're not a client of either of these, please do send us an email at either one of these. You know, we'll, we'd love to hear from you. So I hope you found that helpful and uh, we will see you on the next Lunch and Learn webinar. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.